For us, today's program, Professor Laurie McNeil is the Bernard Gray Distinguished Professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She earned an AB in Chemistry and Physics from Radcliffe College, Harvard University, and a PhD in Physics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. After two years as an IBM postdoctoral fellow at MIT, she joined the faculty of UNCCH in 1984 and has been there ever since. She serves as a deputy editor at the Journal of Applied Physics. Professor McNeil is a materials physicist who uses optical spectroscopy to investigate the properties of semiconductors and insulators. She's a fellow of the American Physical Society, and she has worked throughout her career to enhance the representation and success of women in physics. Together with a colleague in the Department of Music at UNCCH, she teaches a course for first year undergraduates on the physics of musical instruments. Students in this course build their own unique instruments and give a public performance of their own compositions for ensembles of those instruments, some of which I'd be very curious to see. So without further ado, I present uh, Professor Laurie McNeil. Well, thank you very much for that lovely invitation. I'm delighted to be addressing the Capillaria Humanists. On my own campus, I often serve as a liaison from the science side of campus to the other side. And I, um, I think sometimes think that if I were a Native American, I would have a name that would translate as speaks to humanists. <laughs> so let me share my screen and see if we can get the slide here. Okay, are you seeing my opening slide? Yes, okay. we are. All right, so we'll go from there. Okay, so I want to talk today about a subject that uh, I've been teaching a course on uh, for the last more than 20 years, as was mentioned in the introduction, and it's taught me a lot, and I hope that uh, you'll enjoy learning some of the things that we teach in this course. So we're not advancing. There we go. Oh, whoops. Okay, there we go. So uh, if we think about um, musicians and physicists, uh, we often will talk about the same thing, but do it in different words. So a musician would think about a musical note, and a physicist would think about that in terms of a sound wave, because of course the sound that we hear of that musical note is a sound wave. A musician would think about a note having a certain pitch. The physicist is going to think about that in terms of frequency, and we'll see that that is a little more complex than that, but I'll get into that. Uh, a musician thinks about the timbre or tone color of a sound, whether it's bright or dark, and whether it's the kind of sound that a flute makes versus the kind of sound that a violin makes. Uh, a physicist is gonna think about that in terms of the frequency spectrum, what frequencies are present in that sound wave. A musician is gonna talk about the attack and release of a note, how the note begins and how it ends. And the physicist is going to think about that term in terms of the temporal envelope, the evolution of that sound wave in time. Uh, a musician will talk about loudness. How is the, is the note forte? Is it piano? And uh, a physicist will talk about the intensity of that sound wave. And of course, as you can see on the screen, a musician will represent that sound in one way and a physicist will represent it in a different way. But we're all talking about the same thing. And there's a lot of interplay between what we might think of as subjective characterizations of, of sound and objective characterizations that can tell each other a lot. So first thing to know is that the musical sound that you might hear, any kind of a note that someone might produce, sort of a oh, sort of sound, uh, is made up of multiple frequencies. That is, there's not one single frequency, one single rate of vibration present, but actually a multiple of those frequencies. And it's the amount of the different frequencies that are present that determines the tone color or timbre. And in fact, determines what the sound of the instrument is like. So here you see sound spectra uh, uh, from three different instruments. They all happen to be me. Um, and what you see on the horizontal axis is frequency. So frequency increases from low frequencies, which we are, uh, give you low pitches, to high frequencies as you go from left to right. The vertical axis is simply the intensity, how, how much of that frequency we have present in the sound. And you can see that the three uh, spectra that you see there, they're all of the same pitch. They all have the same frequencies. The peaks occur in the same locations on the graph, but 
they have different amounts of each frequency. And so if you think about it, if you had your eyes closed and you heard a pitch that was the same pitch being produced by a recorder, a voice, and a violin, you would have no difficulty in determining which was which and telling those apart. And yet they're, they're, those sound waves contain the same frequencies. It's the amount of the different frequencies that gives it the timbre that's characteristic of those particular instruments. So let's, so um, string, let's first consider stringed instruments. Stringed instruments produce their sound through waves on a string, obviously. And the pulses, if, if you set a pulse going down a string, think of, of sort of a, 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 a laundry line and you whack one end of it and a pulse travels from one end to the other. The speed at which that uh, pulse travels depends on the tension of the string, how tightly it is pulled, and also on its mass density. Thin strings are going to uh, transmit a, uh, a wave more rapidly than thick strings. And if we can get this to go here. Trouble advancing here. Sorry, we're having a little computer failure here. Let's see if we can get back to. There we go. So when you send a pulse down um, to one end of a string, it will be reflected, if the, if the other end is fixed, it will be reflected and will return back to where it started. Now, the time that it takes to do that is twice the length of the string divided by the speed, because it has to go down and come back and it's traveling at a particular speed. And so the time between, if, if you set the time between pulses as one over the frequency, then what you find is that if the time that it takes the pulse to return back to the origin is um, just equal to the time between pulses, then the second pulse will add to the first pulse and that will make a bigger pulse. And so you'll get a bigger and bigger disturbance. And so the frequency at which this phenomenon occurs, what we call the resonant frequency, is the speed divided by twice the length of the string. So you can determine which frequencies will give you a big response and therefore will, will contribute to the sound of the stringed instrument by uh, considering the length of the string and the speed of the wave on the string. And notice that this also works if the, um, uh, if the frequency is twice as high so that the first pulse comes back when the third pulse is, uh, is beginning. And so you have multiple resonant frequencies on this string. So Now, uh, the pulse that's going down one direction and the pulse that's coming back the other way as you can see in the top of my little animation here, those can add together to make what we call a standing wave. The standing wave consists of portions of the string that are moving up and down, as you can see in the bottom of the, of the uh, um, animation, and some places, which we call nodes, where the string doesn't move at all. And these standing waves, which represent the large motion of the string and therefore contribute to the sound the string makes, they occur only at those resonant frequencies. And those resonant frequencies, as we just saw, are in the ratio, the lowest frequency uh, has some, some frequency, the next lowest frequency will be at twice that lower frequency. So the free, and the third one will be at three times that lower frequency. So the frequencies that are present are in, uh, uh, the relationship of one to two to three to four, et cetera. So they're in small whole number ratios. And this is simply a result of the physics of the vibrating string. And we call these the series of frequencies, the harmonic series or the overtone series. And of course the name comes from its connection to music. Oops, let's go back. And we have a little video here. You can see how this works. Oops. Um, there we go. Now, what we're going to see here is a, um, a vibrating string. So we have a, a, a fixed end at each end, and we can see the pulse going down and back. And now we're going to start to vibrate. We'll do that again. And then we'll start to vibrate the string at one of its resonant frequencies. And you'll see what happens. You'll see that the motion begins to build up 
and be larger and larger. And you can hear the ticking, I hope, that represents the frequency. You can hear a tick each time the string moves all the way to the left. And you can see it's at a regular pace. Now we start to vibrate at twice that frequency. And we see that there are two places on the string that are, have a great big motion and one place in the middle, which has no motion at all. That's our node. Now, if we vibrate the string at three times the lowest frequency, which we'll see coming in a moment, there we go. We can set up a standing wave that has three loops. So it has two nodes and three places where the, the displacement is large and its frequency is three times the lowest frequency. And you can hear that lowest frequency clicking and you can see that there are three motions per loop. And now we go up to the fifth harmonic and so forth. So you can see, you, you can detect the pattern. So each of these resonant frequencies is at a simple whole number uh, multiple of the lowest frequency. I think we had maybe enough of that. So here I've drawn the shape of the strings at each of those frequencies. And um, each of those standing waves has its own frequency. And as you can see, they're in those simple relations of one to two to three, et cetera. Now, each of those, uh, the ratio between each frequency of each standing wave and the next corresponds to a musical interval. So the ratio of two to one, the ratio of the second frequency to the first frequency, that ratio is an octave that we know. So, for, so from a C to a C on the piano. The ratio of the third frequency to the second, that three to two ratio in frequency, that's the perfect fifth. And that, that, you would, uh, that would be C to G on the piano. And it sounds like this. The next ratio is the four to three ratio. That's the perfect fourth. That's from G up to C on the piano and so forth. The five to four ratio is the major third. The six to five ratio is the minor third. And the seven to six ratio is what's sometimes called the sub minor third or the blue note, which has a distinct sound I'm sure you're familiar with. So we can see that the intervals within uh, our, our, the, the piano keyboard, they're the intervals within a musical scale are in fact derived from the physics of the vibrating string. So this, this relationship between the physics and the music is extremely close. And in fact, we can see a number of, of other uh, uh, relationships. The uh, ratio of the fourth frequency to the second frequency is again a ratio of four to two, which is the same as two to one. So that's an octave. And the relationship between the third and the sixth uh, frequency is again an octave. So all of these relationships are built into the physics of the vibrating string. And then we can assign each of those uh, frequencies a musical pitch. So if the lowest frequency were C, then the next frequency would also be C because it's an octave higher. Then the next one, it would be G, the third, uh, uh, third partial, which is three times the lowest frequency. Then we go up to C, E, G, B flat, and so forth. So the musical scale is built into the physics of the vibrating string. Now, the vibrating string doesn't vibrate if, if you pluck the string on a guitar, for example, it doesn't vibrate in just one of these frequencies, but a mixture of all of them, just like the spectrum that I showed you earlier. And so the actual motion of the string is much more complex than these simple patterns. But the ear and the brain uh, perceive a distinct pitch for a sound, provided it is made up of frequencies in these simple whole number ratios. So when you hear a note, so hear a sound that has a distinct pitch, and we say, if you can sing along with it, then that means that that sound is made up of a combination of frequencies that are in simple whole number ratios. And again, the amounts we have of these frequencies determine the timbre. And you can see, again, I showed you this spectrum earlier, the, uh, the recorder, the voice, and the violin, so two wind instruments and a stringed instrument, each produce these frequencies that are in these simple whole number ratios. You can see the second frequency is twice the first, the third frequency is three times the first and so forth. So regardless of the instrument, whether it's a stringed instrument or a wind instrument or a percussion instrument, you're gonna get a distinct pitch 
when you have frequencies in these simple whole number ratios. So let's think about playing the melody on a stringed instrument. The lowest frequency, which determines the, uh, the note that you're going to hear, uh, is determined by, as I said, the speed of the wave divided by twice the length of the string. And I told you this, the speed of the wave depends on the tension and the mass density of the string. So if we're gonna change the note that we're gonna hear, we have to change one of those three things. We could shorten the string, uh, decrease the string length. And of course, that's what we actually do on a violin or a guitar. We put our finger on the string so that the vibrating portion of the string gets shorter, that raises the frequency. We could also tighten the string. And of course, if you're tuning a guitar or a violin, that's what you do to increase the frequency, to raise the pitch of the string. You, you uh, tighten the tension, we, you turn little, the little knob. Uh, that's not especially practical for playing a melody, but it allows you to tune the string. And of course, you could use a, th a thinner string to increase the frequency that you can't exactly play a melody by changing the thickness of the string. But you will, if you look, for example, at a guitar or a violin or a piano, you'll see that the strings that play the lower frequencies, the bass strings, are thicker and heavier than the strings that play the higher frequencies. So that's all about the string. What about the rest of the instrument? What about the body of the violin? Why do we need that? Well, we can demonstrate that with my colleague, Brent Wissick, who's been teaching this course with me for over 20 years. And he's going to play what we call the two by four cello. It's a cello. It has cello strings. All of the dimensions of it are exactly the same as the cello. But as you can see, instead of a body, it's made of two by fours. And so let's hear what that sounds like. I don't know about you, but I would not pay good money to hear that. So that, that's our two by four cello. And that nah, 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 nah sound that you hear is the sound of the strings without the amplification provided by the body. And if you look at the spectrum down below, you see that it's dominated by higher frequencies. It's higher frequencies that give us that, nah, that nasal nah, buzzy nah kind of sound. And um, we don't hear very much of the lower frequencies that would contribute to a more pleasing sound and a sound that was more dominated by the pitch of the instrument. But if we add a body to this instrument, a much more beautiful sound because the body of the cello amplifies those lower frequencies that are being produced on the string. You can see in the spectrum down below, it's dominated by lower frequencies. It has very little of the high frequencies. So that warm, rich tone of a cello results from amplifying the lower frequencies produced by the string uh, with, uh, compared to the higher frequencies that give it the meh kind of sound. So the body, makes that amplification, gives us the sound of the cello. Uh, no, no, enough. Okay, well, what about wind instruments? So um, wind instruments, we're thinking about vibrations now in an air column, think about a flute. Now on a string, like we just saw, the waves on the string are transverse. That meaning the string moves up and down, but the wave travels along the string, as you can see in this animation. In an air column, the waves on a, uh, the waves are longitudinal. That is the wave travels in the same direction that the air molecules are moving back and forth. So if you look at this animation, the black arrow shows you the motion of the wave as it moves down the co air column. The red arrow shows you the motion of the air particles. They're moving back and forth, but the wave travels down the column of air. And so, um, so a wave in an air column is a pressure wave. That is, it's a motion of a, an area of higher pressure followed by an area of lower pressure. And you can see that depicted in the animation. Now, when that uh, high pressure pulse arrives at an open end of a tube, as you might find the end, think of the end of a flute, it is reflected, but it's reflected as a pulse of the opposite sign. A high pressure pulse gets reflected as a low pressure pulse. And we can see that in this animation. See the high pressure pulse comes back as a low pressure pulse, which comes back as a high pressure pulse and so forth. Uh, and this was because at the open end of a tube, that's open into the, the uh, 
air of the room. And so the pressure at that end of the tube has to be equal to the pressure in the room. And so uh, that causes that reflection to be at the opposite side. And so after one round trip down and back, the pulse repeats its motion. And that's just like what we saw with the string. So we can see this again, it goes down and back, and then it repeats. So this means that an, a, a tube of air open at both ends is gonna have the same relationship of its resonant frequencies that a string does. So everything we just learned about a string applies equally well to this tube with two open ends. And so we have frequencies that are related to the speed of the wave divided by the length of the tube. And they're in simple whole number ratios of one to two to three, et cetera. So a tube open at both ends like a flute behaves just like the string on a violin. And yes, enough. Now, some instruments, think about the clarinet, are in fact a tube with only one open end. What the, the end that you blow into, that's closed with the reed. And so it behaves like a closed end. And at a closed end, a high pressure pulse is reflected like a high pressure pulse. So let's watch this animation. So at the open end, it's reflected. A high pressure pulse reflects as a low pressure pulse. At the closed end, it reflects, a high pressure pulse reflects as a high pressure pulse. Now this means that it takes two round trips for the pulse to repeat its motion. And so that means that the lowest, essentially it behaves as if the tube were twice as long. And so the lowest frequency for a tube with one closed end will be one half the lower lowest frequency of that same tube with two open ends, or it will be an octave lower. And it also means that we can have only odd multiples of the lowest frequency that will resonate. So the frequencies that are produced by a tube with one closed end are in the ratio of one to three to five to seven, et cetera. So we're gonna get a different uh, relative intensity of those uh, peaks as uh, it, for an instrument that behaves acoustically like a tube with one closed end as we will with a tube with two open ends. Okay. So if you think about a flute and a clarinet, they're approximately the same length. The flute has two open ends and the uh, clarinet has one closed end. The, the end uh, that's closed is of course the end with the reed. So let's look at what we might call the clute and the clarinet. What if we take the mouthpiece of a flute and put it on a clarinet body and take the mouthpiece from the clarinet and put it on the flute body? What would those instruments sound like? So first we get the, uh, um, the So by putting a flute mouthpiece on a clarinet, we get something that sounds like a flute. If we put a clarinet mouthpiece on a flute, we get something that sounds like a clarinet. So the clute is open at both ends. So it gets both odd and even overtones and sounds like a flute. The clarinet has one closed end and therefore has only odd overtones and therefore sounds like a clarinet. And it also plays an octave lower than the flute. So again, all that the sound of the flute and the sound of the clarinet are different because of the characteristics of the resonances in a, an air column. So how do we play a tune on a wind instrument? Well, here's my colleague, Don Ehler. So what he's doing is he's opening holes in the tube. So effectively, he's making the tube shorter. Just like when you play the violin, you press your finger down on the string, you make the string shorter, that makes the pitch higher. He's doing exactly the same thing and we don't need him to do it again. Uh, if you have played the recorder, it's easier to see what you're doing. The, the clarinet has lots of complicated uh, fingerings, but uh, in the recorder, it's clear that if all of the holes are closed, you get the lowest note. As you raise your fingers and open up holes, you get higher and higher notes. Now, the shape of the body also matters. Um, if the clarinet is essentially a cylinder with one end closed, and it has only odd overtones. 
However, the oboe, it has one closed end, that's the, uh, the reed end, but it has both odd and even overtones because the, the bore of the clarinet is not a cylinder, it's a cone. So the clarinet gets, or the, the uh, oboe gets wider as you go from the reed end to uh, the bell end uh, in a conical shape, whereas the clarinet is basically a cylinder. And so if you look at the spectra of the clarinet uh, playing particular note, you see it has only odd overtones, whereas the oboe playing the same pitch has odd and even overtones. So an, a clarinet and an oboe, although they're about the same size, the clarinet's lowest pitch is an octave lower than that of the oboe. And the tone color of the clarinet and the oboe are very different because the clarinet has only odd overtones and the oboe has both odd and even overtones. And so we, we, uh, the, the tone color is quite different. You would never mistake one for the other. Okay, so what about brass instruments? Well, a brass instrument is like an oboe in that it has one closed end, that's the end of the mouth, uh, but its bore is at least partly conical. So it has both odd and even overtones, but instead of uh, opening holes, open and closing holes to change the effective length of the instrument, what a brass player does is change the way that he buzzes his lips to excite different overtones within that overtone series that we've seen. So he can actually selectively choose which overtone he's going to play. If he buzzes his lips at one frequency, he'll get the lowest note. If he changes the frequency at which he buzzes his lips, he can then pick out that second uh, overtone, the third, and so forth. And I want you to listen to this virtuoso player. He can actually manage to get 24 of these overtones simply by changing the buzzing of his lips. What he will do is he has all of the valves on his tuba open so that, uh, excuse me, closed so that he, his, the tube of the tuba, if you like, is as long as it can possibly be. So it's the lowest note the tuba can possibly make. Then he doesn't change the length of the tuba, but he just buzzes his lips to excite the different overtones. So let's listen to this. I think that's extremely impressive. And he didn't even have steam shoot out of his ears. So uh, a brass player plays different notes by choosing which member of the overtone series he's going to excite. Now, of course, if the lowest note of the um, tuba is C, then he can only choose the overtones of, that are in the, the overtone series based on C. And if he wants to choose notes that aren't in that series, he needs to change the length of the tuba. And of course, he doesn't do that by opening holes, but rather by using valves. So, so the valves change the length by adding, sorry, we're, we're done with you. Uh, change the length by adding some of this extra tubing in order to reach the other notes. So what the, uh, the brass player is doing is changing the length of the instrument and also selecting which overtone they're going to, to have uh, sound. Excuse me, Professor McNeil. Yes. Some people are saying they're having trouble with the audio on the clips. Can you turn up the volume on those at all? Um, I'm up at 100%. Uh, excuse okay. me. On the right top left of the screen, if you put your cursor, you'll see it says original sound on or off. I think if you put original sound on, you'll get, I think, I'm not certain, but you'll probably get a better volume out of it. Because I, I did that. I, I was My original sound was off. I put it on, and it sounded better to me. Well, let, let's uh, go back to the tuba player and see what we can get here. Okay. See if this sounds better. A little.
I'm afraid at some level this is a reason why uh, doing concerts over Zoom isn't very effective. It's that was a little better than yeah. previously. Zoom has a, a, a compression algorithm that uh, makes it especially difficult to hear bass notes. It's optimized for speech. And I also know that when, when you re try to share an audio clip, it doesn't come through necessarily come through as well as, as speaking does. Yeah, and again, that's why it's the algorithm. Okay, so um, we've talked about stringed instruments, wind instruments, woodwinds, and brass. What about percussion? Well, let's uh, again, of course, sound is always vibration. With percussion, we have uh, the vibration of rods and membranes. So if we think about the vibration of a rod with two free ends, we see that it makes shapes, this is obviously greatly exaggerated, makes shapes that are similar to those of a vibrating string, but not quite the same. In particular, the end of the rod isn't, uh, isn't a fixed end, and so we have nodes that are uh, not at the ends of the, of the rod, but a little bit away from the ends. Now, the frequencies of these modes of vibration are not in simple whole number ratios, which means that if you simply take a piece of wood, think of a, you know, a chunk of a 2 by 4 and whack it, you don't hear a distinct pitch. You can't sing along with that because the ratios of the resonant frequencies are not in those simple whole number ratios that the ear is seeking in order to identify it as a pitch. So if you simply take a, a, a bunch of pieces of wood and, and whack them with a mallet, you're not going to get a, what you would call a melody instrument. It certainly would add uh, musical interest, but it's not going to be, be able to play a tune. So what you need to do is make the overtones more, more harmonic, more in this ratio of 1 to 2 to 3. And if you think about a marimba, which is absolutely a melody instrument, uh, it consists of these wooden bars, uh, and they are suspended uh, on strings, and the, the place where the, the strings are suspended uh, is done such that it tends to suppress the, uh, the higher partials. So we get more just of the lower partials. So that helps to uh, make more of a sense of pitch. But even more importantly, you can change the frequencies of the first two overtones by carving out this arch on the underside of the, of the, uh, um, of the rod. So if you ever get up close with a with a marimba, look at the underside of the, the marimba bars, and you'll see that they have this arch shape. And that changes the frequency of the first and second partial, so they're much closer to being in a one to two relationship. And so that gives our ear the clue that this is a musical sound, and then you can play a, a melody on the marimba. On a drum head, think about any kind of drum, these are what the, the uh, resonant uh, modes look like, the vibrations of the drum head, and they are not in simple whole number ratios. So if you think about a bass drum, if you just whack that bass drum, you get a nice big thump sound, but it doesn't make a pitch, a specific pitch. And so uh, an ordinary bass drum or a snare drum or a tenor drum, they don't give you a sense of pitch. They just give you that, that percussive sound. But if you think about kettle drums or timpani, you know, they are tuned. They have a particular pitch. And so, um, uh, so how is that done? Well, of course, a kettle drum has a kettle. It has this copper uh, 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 kettle with, it's full of air. And that the resistance of the air to the motion of the drum head affects the frequencies of the vibrating drum head. And it affects different motions of, of the drum head differently. And it, what it does is it causes the, um, uh, the second and the third uh, vibrational mode to come closer to a ratio of three to two in their vibrational frequencies, which gives the kettle drum much more of a sense of pitch. And if you think about kettle drums in, in orchestral music, they definitely have a sense of pitch. It's not as clear a pitch as a flute would give you, or even a trombone, but it definitely has a pitch that you can, can sing along with. Now, other kinds of drums use other ways of changing the frequencies of the different modes of vibration and changing them differently such that they come into these simple whole number ratios. If any of you are familiar uh, with the Indian drum, the tabla, uh, that drum head has a patch in the middle that they've added. It's usually basically iron, uh, iron filings with, uh, in a rice paste. And so they make the center of the drum head thicker and heavier. That changes the vibrations, 
it changes the frequency of the different vibrations and uh, brings them closer to uh, simple whole number ratios, gives the drum much more of a sense of pitch. So a lot of different cultures have, have uh, adjusted their drums in this way to, uh, to give them much more of a sense of pitch. And of course, things like what we think of as African talking drums and so forth, again, it's uh, changing these frequencies to give a sense of pitch. So what is it about that uh, allows us to um, regard two, uh, two pitches as being what we would say consonant or not dissonant, giving a pleasing sound when they're combined? Well, certain, uh, n certain combinations of notes will have overtones that match. If we look, for example, at this set of overtones from uh, a note A, we, and we look at the overtones of the note E, we see that uh, they share some overtones in common. The third overtone of the A pitch matches the second overtone of the E pitch. The, the sixth matches the uh, fourth. And so uh, when those, the two frequencies arrive at our ear, those overtones are uh, in agreement and that gives our ear a sense, uh, or gives our ear, which tells our brain, the, uh, a sense of that those notes belong together in some way, that they are consonant, that they agree in a way that is pleasing. And similarly, the uh, A and C sharp, which are a major third apart, also have some overtones that match up. And if we listen to those together, so here's the, uh, the A and the E. That's a perfect fifth that gives us a pleasing sound because these overtones match up. Similar, the major third. Uh, and so having those, those overtones that match up is what gives us a sense of consonance, a sense of that those notes belong together and give us a, a sound that we regard as pleasing. However, this actually depends on time and place. It's not always been the case that the notes that we in our uh, modern Western culture con consider to be consonant, uh, to be, be a, make a pleasing sound together, that's not been the case in all times and all cultures. Uh, the ancient Greeks uh, at the time of Pythagoras, about 6th century before the Common Era, regarded the only consonant intervals were the octave, the perfect fifth, and the perfect fourth. Every other interval they considered to be dissonant, to be a displeasing sound, didn't belong in their music. Now, uh, by about the 2nd century uh, Common Era, Ptolemy uh, and, and his circle uh, regarded the major third, the 5 to 4 ratio, and the minor third, the 6 to 5 ratio, to also be consonant. So they wanted to have these intervals in their music as well as the, uh, the octave and the perfect fifth and the perfect fourth. So that gave a, a change to the sound of their music. Now, in, in uh, moving to Western European culture, in the 16th to 18th century, uh, they developed what are called mean tone temperaments, that is ways of tuning their scales, because they wanted to have pure major thirds, and that was more important to them than having perfect fifths. Now, um, for reasons that I won't, don't have time to go into, you can't have both. You cannot have a scale that has both perfect fifths that are exactly in the ratio of three to two, and also major thirds that are exactly in the ratio of five to four. So something had to give, they had to compromise, and for the uh, European musicians in, in this period, they wanted the major thirds to be pure more than they wanted the uh, fifths to be pure. So they were willing to adjust the fifths a little to make the major thirds be pure. Uh, the temperament that's most usually used in our modern Western music today, the temperament you'll be using if you play the piano or almost any other instrument, is what's called equal temperament. And that was developed because uh, musicians wanted the ability to play in different keys more than they wanted all of the intervals to be pure in this sense of having simple whole number ratios. They were willing to adjust all of the notes a little bit, uh, except for the octave, to make it easy to play in different keys. And so it, uh, if you go to a piano and play the, uh, you know, a C and a G, those frequencies are not in a simple three to two ratio. They're a little bit adjusted from that. But if you play a, a 
piece in the key of C and then you play that piece in the key of D, it's going to sound the same because the, uh, the intervals among the notes are, the same, are uniform across the keyboard. So that's what we call that equal temperament. And so uh, my, my friends who are, are specialists in uh, 16th to 18th century music practice refer to, to equal temperament as being 12th comma mean tone because all 12 of the notes have to be adjusted a little bit in order to make them all the same. Um, now, of course, we in our Western culture divide the octave into 12 notes. You don't have to do that. And there are plenty of other cultures that divide the octave into other uh, numbers of intervals, 17, 22, 24, 43. There are even some Western composers who've explored this. Uh, so there are a lot of ways to divide an octave, but the octave is a physical entity that results from the vibration of the string or the air column or the rod, and that, that is part of our, uh, the physiology of our ear and our brain as we perceive pitch. But the way that you really want to think about this is the way that Duke Ellington thought about it which is that if it sounds good and it feels good, it is good. And that's the way to judge the music that you hear. If it sounds good, then it is good. It doesn't matter what kind of a, a, a scale is used to produce it or um, uh, you know, how those scales are put together. What really matters is that uh, the music be something that you enjoy listening to. So that's been a whirlwind tour of something that I take a semester to teach. Uh, and so I've had to leave out a great deal. Uh, but I do want to uh, thank you for listening and also thank my collaborators on this, uh, my, uh, my co-instructor for many years, Professor Brent Wissick, uh, Don Ayler, who is my clarinet demonstrator, and Michael Schultz from the North Carolina Symphony, who is my oboe demonstrator, and the many, many students who have taken this class, um, and a few other people who provided some of the uh, video clips and animations. And I'll stop here and be happy to take some questions. Let me stop Great. Sharing. I can see your faces. Thank you very much. Didn't have that many questions come in, but there are a couple. Uh, one of them from Eugene to start off. And this is uh, about asking a technology question about YouTube. You may not know. How does YouTube have an option to play a video at double speed without doubling the frequency, i.e. increasing the pitch of the sound? I have to admit, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Uh, that has to do with, you know, with video technology and how they, um, but I, I don't know the answer. I'm sorry. Okay. And this is a personal comment for me. I, you know, being a former cl clarinet player, I've learned that there's another reason for me to be odd. <laughs> Indeed. And I can, uh, we talked and then, uh, uh, I did have a question when you, uh, it came to my mind. I know there are some musical pieces that uh, literally send chills up my spine. And is that something about the frequencies or the resonances or the octaves that are being hit? Or is it just me that feels that? Or is it? Yeah, I, I think that that's, um, I mean, to some extent, it's that the, the, some of the combinations of the frequencies uh, often will you know, have an edge to them. If you think about, oh, the, you know, the music that is played in a movie when you're going downstairs and about to be attacked by a monster, uh, that sound typically has a lot of high frequencies in it. It's a very edgy sort of kind of sound that uh, tends to, to uh, kind of put us a bit on edge because it sounds more like a mosquito than like a cello. Um, so that's one way that, that uh, a player would manipulate your emotions. But there are also aspects that I think we simply we associate particular kinds of sound with particular kinds of emotions. We tend to associate in Western culture, we associate major keys with major thirds more than minor thirds with music that is more happy and minor keys with music that is more sad. I think that's mostly a cultural uh, thing that, that you don't necessarily find that, for example, in um, uh, Indonesian gamelan music uh, from uh, uh, Bali, that a lot of their pieces are in what we would regard as basically a minor key or a minor mode, and yet they don't necessarily associate that with sadness. Uh, there are certain moments in particular pieces when, you know, a piece that I perform, for example, and I know that chord is coming, and for some reason, it always makes the hair on the back of my head stand up. It's just, there's something about that one moment in that uh, in that piece that always does that to me, and I don't. Uh, on the topic. 
Yeah, but but I think that that, that has to do with how we've you know, how we've experienced that piece more than it is the physics of uh, the vibrations. Okay, uh, Fred had a question uh, about the instrument's size. Given the cello needing a body for amplification, does the vibration get affected by the shape of the interior, i.e. is the air moving inside vibrating as well as the wood? Absolutely. And in fact, the way that the cello makes a sound that you can actually hear uh, is that you draw the bow on the string, which makes the string vibrate. The string is connected to the bridge, so the string makes the bridge vibrate. The bridge makes the top of the cello vibrate, so it's moving up and down. That moves the air that's inside of the cello, and that's what produces that loud sound wave. So that's why, I mean, you couldn't tell in the video, and uh, even if you'd been able to hear it better, but the 2x4 cello is very, very soft. It's very hard to hear it from very far away. The real cello, of course, ha has a big booming sound that can be heard at the back of the concert hall. That's because of the amplification provided by the air moving inside of the cello. Now, that, that air has its own resonant frequencies, and so those have to be matched to the frequencies that the cello produces, which is why the body of a cello is larger than the body of a violin, which of course produces much higher frequencies. So you want a smaller body for the violin so that it will amplify those higher frequencies produced by the violin, bigger body for the cello. Now, those of you who are string players may think about, okay, well, there's the violin and the cello. What about the viola? Well, those of you who've played in string orchestras may be familiar with the phenomenon of viola jokes, that violas are often the butt of jokes. And there's a reason for that, and it has nothing to do with the skill of the viola player. The viola is an underpowered instrument. It needs to be bigger than it is in order to robustly amplify the pitches it plays. But if you have make the viola bigger, you can't oh. fit it under your chin, right? It'd have to be too big. You, you would have to play it more like you play a cello. And in fact, a, a, an acoustic uh, uh, scientist named Carlene Hutchins developed a whole family of instruments modeled on the violin that were the right size for the pitches they would produce. And the instrument that uh, uh, plays the role of a viola in, uh, uh, in a string quartet uh, in her ensemble is what's called a vertical viola. It's considerably bigger and it's played like a cello. It's played down, uh, you know, uh, played <laughs> orientation of a cello. And I tell you, we have one of those that, that was uh, donated to us. And that thing is incredibly loud. And in fact, we had a, a woman in one of our local community orchestras who who played the viol the vertical viola. In fact, she had built the one that, that uh, she played and which we now have. And uh, she was the viola section for that. Uh, <laughs> and she could hold her own against 12 violins because it was just a so much more powerful viola than the smaller one that is just, it's just the wrong size for the, the notes that it's meant to play. Mm -hmm. To follow up on that, Fred asked, uh, with regard to solid body guitars, not having any hollow interior, how much vibration of the body is achieved? Uh, not very much. I mean, if you're a guitar player and, and you turn off your amp and uh, uh, play it and, and touch the body of the guitar, it's there's, you can feel some vibration, but it's not moving enough air to make the sound be loud. And so if you turn off your amp and play your solid body guitar, you're not going to hear very much of anything. And in particular, you're just going to hear the sound of the vibrating string with no amplification of any particular pitch. So it's going to sound more like the 2 by 4 cello than like the real cello. Mm -hmm. uh, Sue had a question. Uh, when you play a chord, you are actually adding more overtones than notes have in common, mm -hmm. right? Is yeah. that about tone clusters, say C, D, E, F? Lots of modern composers use them. So, yeah, so when you play a tone cluster, you're going to not have a lot of overtones in common. And so when we play that, you know, C, D, E on the piano, put your hand down and play those close together notes, we don't necessarily perceive that as being a consonant set of intervals. Now, it has its musical purpose, and that's why the composer has used it. Not, not every sound we hear in a musical composition is meant to be consonant. It's not all meant to be, be pleasing. Sometimes we want to evoke a particular emotion by giving a sound that isn't uh, necessarily consonant. And so we, we respond differently to tone clusters than we do to, say, a major triad. And the, the composer has that in mind. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
I don't see any more questions in the chat. Does anyone else in the, have a question? Looks like Frank Wind has his hand up. And Roland does. Okay, so if I, I don't see all those, oh, there's a hand. Yeah, the Roland, go ahead. Yeah, um, it, I'm thinking about the human ear as a little drum, uh, eardrum and everything, and how it differentiates all these things and everything is a, fascinates me. I, I can't imagine how that works. Okay, the way it works is inside of your ear is the cochlea, which is a, a tube that's wider at the end, uh, closest to the eardrum, and it gets narrow and narrow. It goes to the other end. It's coiled up like a snail shell. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of that tube, which is filled with fluid, is uh, a little uh, a membrane. And attached to that membrane are little hair cells called cilia. And that, as I said, the, the, um, that membrane is wider at one end than it is at the other, which means that the resonant frequencies uh, the, the places that will get a big amplification uh, as the sound wave travels into that fluid are uh, that location depends on the frequency. So f frequencies that are, are um, uh, uh, some frequencies will make a big motion at the far end of the cochlea and some frequencies will make a big motion at the near end of the cochlea. Each of those cil cilia has a, a nerve connection into the brain and so the brain in determines what pitch you're hearing by which of those cilia is being vibrated. Wow, that's that's interesting. Yeah. And Frank, when you had your hand raised visually? Actually, it's my wife who would like to <laughs> yeah. say something. I have a question. So um, I, I have a very particular, music affects me very deeply. Um, most of the modern music I hear in whatever genre, makes me ill, gives me a visceral effect that I really can't handle it. And it's, it's, but there's music that makes me feel wonderful. And our son hears, I don't think for me it's pitches. I think it's, it's more of an emotional reaction. Um, and I'd like you to address that if you can. And also our son Ha really has a problem with certain pitches, even things that we hear that seem sweet and melodic. He found painful. He, he found painful. So um, for him, I don't believe that's an emotional reaction. I think mine is. Um, can you address those two issues? Well, of course, all hearing takes place in the brain. Uh, and so the sound wave arrives at the eardrum, which then stimulates particular cilia within the cochlea, but the actual response to the music happens in the brain. And so our reaction to what, a sound, what meaning a sound carries to us, whether it's a, a meaning that is a pleasing sound or a meaning that is an unpleasing sound or even one that, that makes us, can make us physically feel ill, uh, is, is something that goes on in, in the brain. And so in that sense, it doesn't have anything to do with the physics that the, uh, the, the combination of tones that one person finds pleasing and that another person, person finds displeasing is probably partly a result of what sounds you have been exposed to. And so if you are raised in a, a tradition of you know, being surrounded by particular kinds of music, you may find a kind that's very different from that to be displeasing to you. But if you'd been raised in that sound, you would find it to be pleasing. In the same way, if there are many, many harmonies and uh, sounds that we have in even late 19th century music, which uh, composers in the 17th or 18th century would have thought would, was just total cacophony, and how could you make such a horrible, ugly sound, and why would anybody want to do that? So over time, uh, the things that we regard as being pleasing or not, that, that taste, if you like, does evolve, and it does in individuals as well. But that doesn't mean that any two people, even with the same upbringing, are going to find the same sounds to be pleasing. That's a, a very individual thing. Have you ever done any studies into the physics behind the sounds in uh, bagpipes? Yeah, bagpipe is, is uh, um, I mean, it's a lot like an, an oboe in that sense. It is a, uh, um, uh, a you know, a, a slightly conical, device with a, a reed at one end. I mean, the only difference is that you produce the sound not by blowing through the reed, but by using a bag to blow through the reed. But other than that, it's very similar. 
and um, the uh, the shaping of the um, of the tube tends to emphasize more of the high frequencies. So you get more amplification of the high frequencies compared to the low frequencies because of the shape of, of the, the tube, which is called the chanter. And so that's why it gets that very um, <laughs> that people don't find so pleasing. Um, but it's really just, it's, it's kind of an oboe on steroids in there. Thank you. <laughs> I think Sherry had a question. Yes, um, very interesting uh, talk. I'm having a difficult time wrapping my hands around different octaves with different parameters. Um, I can understand a tonic music, but to me, an octave, you have like a, a natural G and, and then you have one octave higher. I, I can't understand intellectually or musically that you can have a different octave. If you could just kind of explain that a little bit better. I don't want to be ethnocentric here. Uh, well, the, the octave, actually, every culture has it because it's the, the basic physics of uh, the uh, a string vibrating at twice the frequency as its lowest frequency. So if you think about the piano and you think about middle C, uh, that frequency, and then you think about the, the C above that, and if you play those two together, they sound they sound like the same note in some sense. We, that's why we assign them the same name. Yes. And in fact, often, if you uh, listen to, say, a woman and a man singing together, singing the same notes, uh, you'll think, oh, you know, they're singing in unison. They're singing the same pitches. But generally, they're not. They're singing an octave apart. Uh, my husband is a tenor, and when he and I sing together, I'm a soprano, he sings an octave below me. But we think of that as being the same note because, again, going back to the cochlea, the, uh, if we think about the overtones of uh, the lower C and the overtones of the higher C, a lot of them are going to match up because the frequency of uh, the higher C is twice the frequency of the lower C. And so its second uh, overtone is going to be twice the frequency of the second overtone of the lower C and so forth. And so we're going to have a lot of, of overtones matching up. And that makes our brain interpret those, those two notes, those two Cs, as being the same note, even though their frequencies are, in fact, the higher uh, C has a frequency that's twice as high, twice as large as that of the lower C. So the fact that, that the octave to us represents it's the same note except not quite is a result of the, those overtones matching up. So then when you said that the octaves are different in different cultures, do you mean that it just begins at a different point? No, I mean, every culture has the octave as one of the fundamental musical intervals of their music. And so they may divide that up. I mean, in Western music, we divide the octave into 12 parts, right? The 12 notes of the chromatic scale. Other cultures take that same octave, but they divide it differently. So can you expand upon that? It's still an octave. It's still an octave. So the, the, the higher note is still twice the frequency of the lower note. But instead of, of, of saying there are 12 notes in between those two, uh, in other cultures, there might be 15 notes in between. Oh, OK. OK. But Thank the octave you. is still the octave. To follow up on that, Sonia had asked, can you give some specific examples of a culture that has it, like a 15 note? 15 note there are, there are a number of such scales in the uh, music of the Indian subcontinent in particular. Uh, okay. If you look at some of the ragas that, that, that they play, they, they divide the octave uh, into more than 12 notes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jean had a question. Uh, so in terms of physics, it seems that the quality of the instrument has everything to do with its shape, and if this is correct, why is a Stradivarius worth millions and the violin the kids play at school worth 60 bucks when the shape, the difference, when they're the same shape? Well, they're, they're, it turns out they're not quite the same shape. They look the same, but there are a lot of very subtle differences. For example, the, um, the top of the violin where the bridge is attached, that piece of wood is not the same thickness everywhere. It, it has a very subtle shaping. It has an arch. And so the art of making a wonderful violin has to do with dealing with all of those very uh, 
very, very small and subtle details in ways that we don't completely understand. There are plenty of scientific articles about what makes a Stradivarius great, and um, it turns out that it's a lot of things, but exactly what, uh, you know, is, is there one of them that's more important than another? Is the exact, uh, the stiffness of the wood, you know, the, the tree from which that uh, violin was made, and, you know, how much rain did it get 30 years before it was cut down, and uh, the details of the varnish, which of course changed the stiffness of, of, the, uh, uh, of the violin, the, those shapings of the thickness, the exact shape of the curvature, uh, the shape of the F holes, exactly where they're placed. All that level of detail will take a, a, um, uh, an okay violin to being a great violin. Now one thing I can tell you uh, is that um, the, the top of the violin and the back as well have their own vibration well, frequencies, their own resonant frequencies. And you want to tune those to the frequencies that the violin is going to produce, the, the notes that you want to play. And so if you don't shape the top just right so that it's, the, it's resonant frequencies, which you can uh, measure by, by tapping the, the, the uh, top of the violin before you attach it, before you build the violin, and listening. If those don't match the, uh, the pitches that you want for, uh, the violin to play, then you won't get a good violin. So that's one thing that bad violins uh, have wrong with them that good violins don't. But what makes a, uh, the difference between an, an incredible violin and one that's merely good is all in the details and in, in ways okay. that we don't completely understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jean had a follow-up question for you, I think, on the same topic. Jean? It's Jen, but that's okay. I'm sorry, Jen. You can call me Jean. I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, this is actually a follow-up question to what uh, Frank's wife, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Jean, is it? D. D, D thank you. Um, it, it, you know, I found what you said very interesting, and I'm wondering about discordant notes, because discordant notes theoretically should sound awful to us, but very often sound good when they're placed properly in a piece where they, you know, because you were talking about horror music or certain types of music where this discordant sound somehow sounds pleasant to the or or correct to the ear, even though it's not pleasant music. And so. the composer's intention is not always to make you hum. Sometimes he wants you to make you have a different kind of emotion. And so, you know, composers know this and judiciously make use of sounds that we would, wouldn't necessarily find pleasing, but we find to be appropriate. That it's, it's right for the music at that point, even though it isn't a sound that, that uh, you know, uh, that makes you happy that you would want to listen to that sound continuously for a long time, but it evokes the right uh, emotion or the right uh, intellectual pleasure in that sound at that moment. Carol, have you had a question? You need to unmute, Carol. Yeah, um, actually my, my husband does. Uh, he wanted to know if there's if it's possible for you to place or, or um, Play something that is in a non-Western um, scale. Do you um, have an example? Not, with what, example? not not immediately available, but if you uh, uh, on YouTube, you'll be able to find some. Okay, we will do that. Thank you. Good question, Judy. You had were raising your hand visually. Yeah, I can't find the little hand on the bottom. I'd like to go back to the wood, the use of the, how important the wood is. At what point does a violin maker know that the piece of wood he's using is good or not? If it depends on, you know, 30 years ago, it got rain or didn't get rain. And well, of course, they, you know, they, they have the wood and it's been cured and dried and so forth, but they do a lot actually with what are called tap tones of, you know, carving the shape and then tapping on it and listening to it and then carving a little bit more over there and tapping on it and listening to it. And if it isn't getting any better, they'll probably take another piece of wood. So, but of course, a, a good violin maker has a lot of experience in knowing that, you know, if I uh, buy wood that has this, you know, characteristic, its density, you know, how heavy it is, 
Uh, does it have knots? And you know, does it look good? Is it the right kind of wood? And then treating it properly, drying it carefully, and so forth. I mean, they like any craftsperson, they know how to treat wood such that you know, if I did it this way, it came out good, even though they're not sure exactly why that is. And in fact, most violin makers know very little about the physics. It, it's a craft, and mm -hmm. they uh, which they exercise to a beautiful degree. They know that if I do this. This is what happens, even if they're not sure exactly why. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Robert Bosca, you had a question? Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Um, well, let me put my hand down. Um, no, it was just a, a, a comment about the Stradivarius. And I, I'm sorry that I don't have the reference. Uh, I was listening to a podcast just a few days back. And I can't remember exactly where I was on a walk and I listened to a few different things. Anyway, uh, they said that there was a recent study that proved that it was the varnish that was primarily responsible for Stradivarius. I, and I'm not sure, I don't remember the evidence or anything, but. There's a lot of studies that claim to have proved that, it's, that it was one thing. And they all of course disagree with each other as to yeah. what that one thing is. Is, is that I mean, the what answer, they're trying to sell? Yeah, I mean, the answer has to be that it's all of these things and which ones are more important than others uh, or are they all equally important is not clear. And we should also remember that when we listen to a Stradivarius today, we're not hearing the sound of the instrument that, that uh, Stradivari had produced. Uh, they change over time. It, it's wood and it, it uh, changes the way it resonates as it, as the, uh, as it ages as it gets played. And so even the sound we hear now is not the same sound of the new violin then. Okay. Fred, you had a comment you wanted to make? Uh, yeah, as far as uh, pleasing sounds and discordant sounds, I've owned many guitars over the years and I've found that more important than the quality of the guitar is the uh, expertise of the player. Of because you, you can have cheap instruments and if you have an excellent guitarist it sounds great and you can have discord in a piece but it depends what follows it and what comes after that any you can't just take a section and say well this sounds terrible you got to listen to the whole piece and see what the composer or whatever intended uh, which makes more difference to me i found than the quality of the instrument Oh, that's absolutely true. The quality of the player is is the determining factor, and uh, an excellent player can make even a bad instrument sound good. Okay, and I have one more question here. Uh, evidently, Carol asked, is there a difference between well-tempered and equal-tempered? Yes, well-temperament is uh, was one of the temperaments that was developed in the... Uh, I'm sorry? The well temperament uh, is a temperament, or, which is to say a, a tuning system that was uh, created in the early 18th century. It's on its way to being equal temperament, but it's not quite there. And so it's, it's a temperament that's it's somewhere between the mean tone temperaments that were uh, popular in the, um, in the 17th century and uh, the equal temperament that became what was developed in the late 18th century. So it's, it's a transitional temperament in between. And there are a bunch of temperaments, Werkmeister is another, that, that were being developed around that time, or the time of, of, of uh, J.S. Bach. And um, they're all sort of on their way to being equal temperament. Okay. I don't see any other questions or anybody's hand raised. Sherry sure, did have a comment I'd like to repeat here that she's delighted that she can enjoy good music without having to understand all this as a prerequisite. Absolutely. But I, uh, hope, I hope that by uh, hearing a little bit of this, that will enhance your enjoyment of the music that you love. Certainly you can enjoy music without knowing anything at all about any of this. You can be a good musician without any knowing any of this. But uh, certainly my, my colleague who is a, a, a performer on the cello, feels that as if his students know more about how the instrument works, they're able to become better players. But certainly, uh, I hope that this adds to your enjoyment of the music that you like to listen to. I think I agree with that very much. It's always better to know, understand stuff. And again, I want to thank you for your time today. I do appreciate